praise the Lord. What a joy it is to sing about the powerful and victorious name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Greetings to each one of you in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are, for the last couple of weeks, we have been pulling some thoughts from Acts chapter 9, which covers perhaps the most dramatic conversion experience in the New Testament. Um, and Luke recounts this conversion experience in three places in Acts. Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. And when we read each of these portions, we can see a different angle or a glimpse of that dramatic moment that Saul experienced. Since we read from Acts chapter 9 the last uh, couple of times, uh, I'm going to switch to another version of the same event uh, narrated by Paul himself uh, in Acts chapter 22. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts 22, 6 through 21. And it's a lengthy portion, but I feel like we need to read the whole thing to understand the context. So Acts chapter 22, 6 through 21. As I was on my way, and this is Paul speaking to the Jewish crowd in Jerusalem. They, Paul is being uh, arrested, and there's a, a uh, angry mob uh, waiting to do something harmful to him. And so he's talking to them. As I'm, I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came to Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And why now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Verse 16 again. And now why do you wait? This may be a question for some of you. Verse 17 onwards. And when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Let me highlight two verses that I just read from above. Verse 8, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And also verse 21. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So today morning, I just want to cover the essence of Paul's conversion experience. How did this visible encounter face to face with Jesus mold Paul's theology and how did it mold his his ministry. How did seeing and hearing from the risen Jesus save, uh, serve as a foundation to Paul's teachings? 
I won't get into too much depth, but I, I want to link what we just read in, chapter, in verse 8 and 21 that I highlighted at the, at the end with some of the key mysteries that we see in, the, in Paul's epistles. And I don't want this just to be a mere information sharing opportunity, but my prayer is that through the word that is being spoken, that each one of us will be able to experience Christ and know Jesus more. So there are three uh, mysteries that I'm going to pull out, or three th thoughts or teachings of Paul. First, to the encounter with Jesus, Paul realizes that Jesus is alive. In the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was the primary theme of the gospel. When we read through the past uh, chapters, we know that, that the apostles preached uh, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this was also a key theme for Paul as well. In the case of Paul, we see Paul debating with the Jews and, and even with the pagan philosophers in Athens, which we will read later, about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And due to the lack of time, I won't read about every single instance of this, but as we go through the series of Acts, I would ask that you would pay attention to how important this truth of Jesus being risen from the dead is to the gospel message. And when we look at the epistles of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the most important chapters when it comes to Paul describing not only the resurrection of Jesus, but also the significance of how that applies in our life. And Paul makes perhaps the most dramatic statement regarding the truthfulness and the reliable and the relevance of Christianity. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 17, Paul says this. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. If we are found to be misrepresenting God, we've testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So Paul is basically saying, look, if Christ has not been risen from the dead, we might as well go back home close the store or close the church and call it good. We need to grasp the seriousness of this truth. The hours and hours we're spending uh, reading the word, the hours and hours we spend, spend praying, attending church services, serving in church, walking in holiness, singing songs to Jesus, all is in vain if Jesus Christ is not, was not risen from the dead. Later in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 Paul builds upon this. Of course, we know Christ rose from the dead, but what does this mean for us? And we just read that, uh, that if Christ was risen from the dead, we would also rise from the dead. And he all goes on to say this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. This is the first mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we, we should all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So the mystery of the rapture of the church is revealed to Paul. Starting by means of seeing the risen Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus, depending on whether we are dead or alive at the moment, we will either be resurrected from the dead or we will be raptured into the midair to see Christ face to face. And we will... Uh, we will one day take on that same glorious body as Jesus did and has, and we will see him just as he is within a twinkling of an eye. Now, let me move on to the next key thought or mystery. Through the revelation of Christ and the road of Damascus, Paul realizes that Jesus and his church are one. When Paul went about approving the death of Stephen, and rounding up men and women, dragging them out of homes, beating them. Little did he know that he was persecuting not just those people, but he was persecuting Christ himself. Jesus answered him when, while Christ, Saul was on the ground, he was blinded by the light. And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You've been, you've been wanting for Jesus to say, 
I am Jesus and you are persecuting my people. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said is, you are persecuting me. And Jesus was not just feeling a solidarity because, you know, because they believe my message. There's a oneness in our message. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is almost making the point that physically there's a oneness. There's, a, there's, there's some kind of oneness between him and the church to where he, can, he feels the persecution that Saul was doing towards the people that believe in his name. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And he is the head. And here, let me read another mystery that we see Paul teaching. Ephesians chapter 5, 28 to 32. He exhorts us to husbands and wives, but then he takes a turn. He says, in verse 28, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as... Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery is profound. That's why even I was not able to completely explain how this works. No, even Paul was not able to explain how this works. The union of Christ and the church. But we know this, that he is the head and we are the body. We, we symbolically consist of various functions and organs of this body. And we cannot do without each other. Just as much as we cannot do without Jesus. We are united together in Christ Jesus as a whole organism. The truth of in Christ Jesus, and, and this phrase, I, I highlight this because sometimes when we read through the epistles, we read it like in Christ Jesus, as if it has no significance. But that phrase, when, when Paul and the other apostles say in Christ Jesus, it, it derives from the same truth that we are one with Christ. In, in Ephesians 1, Paul says that God the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's not, it's not that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing because we are special and we, uh, you know, we, we are doing good things. It is that he has blessed us in every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. We are in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In Christ, we are a new creation. This truth, and I, I want to encourage my younger brothers and sisters, as you're reading scripture, when you see the phrase in Christ, remember that is about the union of Christ and the church. And everything that we have, all the spiritual blessings we experience, comes by means of being united with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And lastly, Paul, the third mystery or the third revelation, Paul realizes that, that Gentiles are part of God's plan of redemption. Here's a man, Paul. He was, he, you know, he had Judaism running in his veins. He was the most zealous, zealous Jew in his time, in his age group. He was far ahead of others in his age group. He was going to be somebody of great significance and influence he wanted to eradicate the church because it was bringing dishonor to his way of life. But Jesus told him, go, for I send you far away to the Gentiles. That was the call for Paul. And later, we know that Paul, we, we, and not later, just we know from history that Paul is coined as the apostle to the Gentiles. Because no other apostle has had the impact that Paul has to planting new churches and expanding the gospel to the ends of the earth. And Paul describes the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles as a mystery in Ephesians chapter 3. So Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 6, if you can turn there or look at the screen, this is what Paul says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, 
how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. And when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was, which, uh, was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6, this mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So through the face-to-face -face encounter that Saul of Tarsus has with Jesus Christ, it not only transforms him, but he, it gives him a special insight to, to write and teach about three mysteries. One being the mystery of the resurrection and rapture of the, of the saints. Second being the mystery of the union between Christ and the church. And lastly, the mystery of, of Jews and Gentiles being fellow heirs with Christ. And from the, um, from the portions I read before, uh, I did not, some, for some of them I did not read it out loud, but when you look at the, the context of the passages, there's another hidden mystery that is in between, the, a fourth one. That is, and this mystery is very personal to Paul. It's a mystery of why Paul was chosen. After all he did to harm the church. Paul deserved to be struck down by lightning or, or pronounced dead on the scene. But from the moment that he was, from, from he was knocked to the ground and he was blinded to, to bearing all the sufferings for carrying the name of Christ, to being given a thorn of flesh because of the deep revelations he saw in third heaven, Paul was humbled and made nothing in the process. He saw himself as truly unworthy. And I'm just going to pull two, ver two verses from the chapters we read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Ephesians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, 8 to 9, As one untimely born, Jesus appeared to me as well. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Though I am the least of the saints... This grace was given to preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Paul always saw himself as an outsider. I mean, if we were in the shoes of Paul, we would see ourselves distinct from others as well. Yes, Peter disowned Christ and all of that, but he did not persecute a single person. He did not approve in the murder of Stephen. You know, other disciples may have deserted away for a time. Thomas may have doubted that Christ risen from the dead. But no one has gone to the extent of someone like Paul, who it says he was unworthy. He's the least of apostles. And he was transformed and, and, and given grace and called for the apostleship. Hallelujah. And he said, and, 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 to, and, and he, he always was an outsider, and he, to some extent, he preferred it that way too. There, you know, Paul has a particular personality. As you read through, you can see this. And he didn't want to be linked with the apostles, actually. And, and when, when he says, you know, the revelations he received from Christ, he received from Christ himself. He said, what I have received from the Lord, I deliver unto you. He was his own man. He, he, in, in Galatians, he goes on to link to say, I, did not, I wasn't taught by anyone. I was not you know, brainwashed by anyone. I received the revelations directly from Christ. And sometimes you know, that, that part of him may have been because of his personality. But it also may have, been to, may have to do with knowing who he was, the chief of sinners, saved by his grace, called and set apart by the gospel, for the gospel by Jesus Christ himself. And as the worship team comes up, I want to conclude with reading another passage of Scripture that's a deeply profound in a personal way that gives me, even me perspective in times of weakness and failure and struggle. And I, I want to share with you these words from Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 to 17. You can pull that up or you, uh, you can see it on the screen or you can 
open it. First Timothy chapter 1, 12 to 17. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, or insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly, ignorantly in, dis, in unbelief. And grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason. This is the most profound, is that that in me, as the most foremost, Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example. If Christ can save the Apostle Paul, change him from Saul of Tarsus the persecutor to Paul the Apostle, then all of us have hope. Yes. Hallelujah. No one is irredeemable. No one is outside of the, of the arms and the reach of Christ. No one is outside the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How, how can we treat some people as if they cannot change? Church, if Paul can be changed in an instant, anyone can change. Then this is my other favorite part. The next verse, he goes into a mode of worship. Just thinking about how he was gloriously saved. He says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us take a moment of time and just think about, hallelujah, the glorious way the Lord opened our eyes to see the truth. To convert that thought and that, that, that into worship. Hallelujah. We were not converted by some philosophies. We were not converted because we, we thought we were great or we were just a little bit bad, but God just pushed us over the edge and now we think we're good. No, there was a conversion that happened that converted us from children of darkness to the children of light. If you look at your own life, you know that Christ knows you like no one else. He knows your private thoughts. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows even your future. Yet, because, beside it all, in time, in your time, Christ came and he opened our eyes to see the truth of the gospel, to worship him in spirit and to the call of our Father, Abba Father. And for that, he deserves all the glory. Hallelujah. The immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory and power and majesty and dominion forever and ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us worship the Lord together. Hallelujah.